Hello, welcome to the first session of DebtNet here in Prague. It's always nice being back and uh, appreciate everyone for being here in person and online. Uh, I'm Lou Berger, this is Janusz Farkas. Also online, we have Eve Schuler, who has come over to us uh, as, who was raw chair, is now our working group secretary. Help uh, continue on that uh, uh, transition. It's the first day, so please take a look at uh, the note well. It covers uh, our processes and rules for disclosure. Um, highlights are everything you say here should, uh, it, you should know that everything that's said here becomes part of our record. It is recorded. We have video, we have audio, um, and it, it remains as a contribution to the IETF, and we have rules, we have PCPs. If you're not familiar, please go take a look at the, the link at the bottom of the page. Next. Part of our um, guidelines, the rules that we operate under, is we have a, a, a code of conduct. Basically, treat everyone with uh, respect, interact with each other professionally, uh, stay away from anything that is uh, personal. And as long as you treat everyone with respect, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be good. Generally, the group is good with that, but you know, we all have lapses, we're all people. It's important to keep this in mind when interacting, even when we're having a passionate technical debate. You've made it here. So you're familiar with, uh, uh, for those of you online, you're familiar with Meet Echo. For those of you in, your, in the room, please make sure to scan in. We may have uh, polls and it's really important to uh, have the tool available for that. And more importantly, we're running a shared queue between those who are online and those in the room. So if you wanna speak at the mic, please use the tool to enter the queue. Next. Uh, blue sheets we don't pass around anymore. Uh, that's now automatic through the tool. So that's another reason why you, it's important to show that you're here. Um, that is sometimes useful personally, but it's also useful in helping to schedule the room size. We are using a collaborative note taking tool. Uh, please join us there. We have several people who have already said they'll take notes, but it always is helpful for others. This is particularly important if you make a comment at the mic, because then you can go and make sure your comment is, at, is appropriately captured. So please join us there and, and help take the notes. Um, the agenda is, uh, has not changed since it was announced at the end of last week. Uh, and the only thing that we've done is we've added in the right version numbers. Next. We have two sessions. Today's session is gonna be focused on um, the working group status, and then moving into our top, the raw topics. So this is work that's come over from the raw working group, and it's DebtNet over wireless, and uh, DebtNet interacting with wireless domains. And that's gonna be the primary uh, part of the, the bulk of this session. We also have a few minutes, um, the last part, where David Black is going to give a report out on the open meetings that have been taking place related to our enhanced data plane. And the next session is going to have quite a number of uh, descriptions of proposals for queuing to support the enhanced data plane as well as some other related uh, topics. And um, that's on Wednesday. For some reason, I was thinking it's on Tuesday, but it's not, it's on Wednesday. Um, so please join us there as well, next. Um, we do ask that authors, when they present, they, uh, if you've presented before, please focus on uh, changes and uh, what it's going to take to complete the document. That's for working group documents. And for new drafts, I uh, really want to summarize what is the, the delta to our existing or prior work and why the working group should be interested in it. Um, we also are going to do something a little different today. 
this was inspired by a comment made uh, by one of the LSR chairs uh, this morning about leaving time. So we're gonna run a clock for everybody um, and particularly the non-working group documents. And we're gonna subtract two minutes and so that we ensure that there's time available for uh, discussion. Next. Okay, so uh, this, doc, this uh, summarizes where we are in the document publication process. Uh, we have a few documents or, that are with the uh, AD, and I'd like to, I don't know if Roman is in the room, but uh, uh, he's helping us out. No, am I, didn't Roman make the comments on these? Yes, he did. Am I losing my yeah, mind? I don't think he, we expect him in the room. Oh, okay, but he did make comments and, um, for the authors of those three working group documents, please make sure to respond to his comments as well as the comments of the other area reviewers. Um, the formatting on this is really confusing. It was not this way in the PowerPoint. I guess we should look at the P PDF. Um, there are uh, some revisions that are needed. So that means we're with the authors. And uh, so that's uh, definitely authors take note. Please review the comments and make sure all comments are addressed. Greg? Okay, Greg went in line and now he's out of line. Okay, uh, I don't think there's anything else that's worth talking about here. Next. Uh, on the agenda, we have uh, three topics. Three, uh, one of them is the uh, three charter topics, excuse me. Um, including uh, scaling and raw architecture. Raw architecture is going to come up shortly. I'm hoping Pascal is online because I do not see him on, in the room. Uh, not on the agenda are control frame framework and, and also the raw framework. Uh, Pascal is going to talk about the raw framework in his slides. For the controller plane, plane uh, framework, do we have any of the authors in the room? Because I don't believe we've seen an update on the list. Generally, we ask for an update. So I would say that that's a good indication of if you would like to contribute to a working group document, please take a look at this document and send a mail to the authors and to the list saying you're willing to contribute on it. We are contribution driven. If a working group document does not have contribution from the authors, you're welcome to join it. Actually, that's true for any document, but particularly true for things like this that seem to have uh, lost attention. This is good work. We think it's important, uh, but we need we need people to help us out on it. Next, um, we had no incoming or outgoing liaisons. We're now going to talk a little bit about our charter. At the last IETF, we talked about the impact of the charter for uh, because of the raw working group rolling back in uh, to DebtNet. So we have a couple of slides on this, and we have one person in queue. Carlos Bernardo, UC3. One comment from uh, about the previous slide on the documents. There is also the, although expired, the raw industrial requirements. We, I mean, in the past meeting, we discussed uh, whether, for example, I, I could join in the team to help. We have been having some offline discussions. The idea will be to uh, submit a new version this week. So that will be yet another document that we need to take care of. It's not in the agenda because we are just resuming, but uh, our plan was to submit a new version with minor changes with the new name, DeadNet Raw, right. and then ask for comments on the mailing list. That, that's great. My memory is that was a raw working group document, correct? So yes. The, yes. So the agreement we had is, is that anything that was a raw working group document doesn't have to go through adoption. It just comes right in. So uh, submit with the new name and we'll definitely accept it and uh, move forward with it. Okay, so thank thanks. you, that's great. Thanks. Okay, so the uh, milestone uh, update, first of all, is being driven by RAD, John who's in the room, and um, we appreciate the work there. There was actually quite a number of minor editorial fixes in it. I'm not gonna go over those. They really are purely editorial. There were two differences, and I believe we actually, it, it, they're pretty much the same as what we talked about at the last meeting. Uh, in the first paragraph, 
basically acknowledge the work that's going on with RAW explicitly. So wireless was always part of the DETNET charter. It was in our, our original use cases, but it didn't receive a lot of attention. So it really doesn't take much in the early part to acknowledge uh, that we're doing wireless, but we wanted to make it explicit. The other change was we had um, Corliss, who I saw earlier, I think he's here, um, suggested that we add reordering since that's something we're doing and it's something we're doing. So that, I think that's fairly non-controversial. Uh, keeping you know, along the, the line of, of making the wireless support explicit, we've also added, and this is the substantive change, a new paragraph that talks about uh, the wireless related work. And this paragraph is largely lifted from the raw charter. Uh, so again, should not be controversial, but it's good to acknowledge the change. Next. Another way, if anyone has questions, feel free to come to the mic. We had not looked at our milestones in a while. So part of the charter update was to go look at the milestones and say, what, what are the right dates to uh, match the work that we're doing currently or we see coming down the pike? I'm not gonna go through all the dates, but you're welcome to take a look here, take a moment, see if your document that your author or contributor on is listed and what the target dates are. If you have any comments, we'd love to hear them now or on the list. Moving forward, next. And now we're gonna go into sort of our standard wrap up uh, slides for the chairs. Uh, we do have an IPR process that we follow. This is, um, this is widely followed in uh, a number of working groups, particularly in the routing area. We um, always poll at the time of adoption and again at uh, completion. Uh, and this is really going back to that note well where part of our process is, is disclosure of known IPR if you're contributing to work. If you, so this is really very important. We've had late IPR uh, in other working groups at other times and that really hinders the process. Thank you, next. We do like to be friendly to those who are not able to travel to the meetings. We also want to have progress faster than our, the, the sort of the tempo of our meetings. So please use the list, continue having virtual meetings. We can do informal as well as formal using um, uh, Meet Echo. Uh, we, I think WebEx is still not working, right? Right, uh, so uh, maybe WebEx will come back someday, but uh, not yet. But we can use the working group resources uh, to support these um, uh, making progress faster than just the physical meetings. So please use those, please uh, uh, talk on less. Now, uh, I see David Black in queue, David. Wanted to uh, reinforce the point about informal working meetings. Uh, right now, we have none scheduled, and whether to schedule future ones is a topic to be discussed uh, when we get around to me at the end of this session. Okay. I'm making a note to meet Echo in case anyone's listening that the remote audio is not great in the room. Uh, I don't know if, uh, actually, Eve, were you able to hear David uh, clearly? Um, I was able to hear David, um, and it was okay, but it, just as you pointed out to me, it was a little bit overdriven, but um, I could understand what he said, and it was about um, pointing out <laughs> future interim uh, meetings. Okay, unfortunately, my ears are not great at muffled sounds and I'm not hearing the remote uh, speakers very well. Hopefully, Medeco will uh, um, help us out there. Uh, Is this any better? I've repositioned the mic. I think nope. we should just try to press Okay, forward. carry on, sorry. And uh, we have uh, Pascal now. And Pascal, you have 20 minutes. Are you driving the slides or do you want to pass me the ball? Uh, we'll pass it to you. Okay, I see it. Thank you, Luke. 
Mm. So yes, I mean, this is work that uh, was transferred from the raw working group back into DeepNet as we merged uh, or span in whatever the term raw back into DeepNet. Um, one of the major things which happened at the time uh, was um, some good amount of uh, terminology work. We we have some terminology coming from the wireless world. We have some terminology coming from, I would say, globally the MPLS world, and and they differed, and and so went through this exercise of trying to converge. Um, there was also some trouble with uh, east, west, north, south, which is uh, very much overloaded. So we wanted to to get rid of that and. Um, basically give the intention of going forward between uh, the source and destination or across, meaning when you have multiple parallel lanes then, and you switch lane basically just like a car would on the highway, um, express this uh, using the, the term crossing. <clears throat> so this, this, the, the, this big discussion about the term track ended up with this proposal of using recovery graph and uh, I've seen a mail by Lou this morning, actually, about recovery graph versus, I guess, recovery path again. And so my memory of this is we came up with graph because of the fact that the CPF, the centralized CPF, so the controller, if there is one, will feed um, the a point of local repair, which used to be the PSC, with possibly a graph as opposed to path. And, and a subset of that graph being instantiated at some point of time to become the, the recovery path, that's going to be used. So we wanted to make the distinction between like the set of all the vertices um, that constitutes the graph versus a particular instance subset of that, which is used as the recovery path at a single point of time. So I don't know if that's convincing, but at least I, I answered that to you, Lou, on the mailing list, and, and we can continue that discussion. But basically my memory of this side meeting that we had was that recovery graph was the term, that's what I wrote down at the end of that meeting. Um, so, so these are the, the big changes the, for the raw people. Uh, certainly, the going from PSC to PLR is a big change because we've used PSC so much. And and then there was this this term which we we saw a lot in in sixties, for instance, about serial or simple tracks, really meaning a, a sequential set of nodes from A to B meaning that a uh, recovery path would have at least uh, a certain amount of parallel lanes to ensure redundancy between A and B. And so this term lane uh, came after the London meeting with the, in the discussions that we, we committed to have with Don Fadek uh, for, for the terminology thing. And this really expresses a subset of, of the path which is one sequence sequence of hops, basically. So this, sorry. This term was, was very useful in the ripple domains. And so we, we, since we needed a term and we wanted a converged term now between what we do in IoT and what we're doing here, lane appeared to be the term. Um, then there was this recommendation by Greg, I guess, about um, using oper operational plane, which is operational is a subset of the controller plane, which deals with operation as opposed to management. Um, so, so we went for that. I'm still open, but I took, you know, uh, Greg's expertise on, on that term, so I used it. Um, then again, it's new, so it can still be discussed. And, and we insist now that we are using a lot of uh, terminology from MPLS references and we give those new references. 
knowing that in the wireless domain, I'm not aware of anything MPLS. So we are converging the terminologies, the meaning, but we are not converging the technology as far as I know there is. We can use those terms without necessarily implying that we are using labels. So I, I picked those two sentences, which are big changes or, or important additions to the architecture, just to make sure that people are aware that those, new, those sentences are uh, in, in the document now. Uh, so the first one reuses this term operational and says that the PLR and, and what we call the OEM supervisor, which is the thing that digests um, the result of, of the OEM operation, um, the, well, they are they are in the operational plane. Basically, that's what we 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 want to to, to document here because we are really doing this architecture. We want to position things, give names to 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 squares, basically, and to drawings. And so now those two elements would belong to the operational plane. <clears throat> um, and also, we we insist that we are layer three and and uh, operation and we interact with lower layers, uh, just like DeathNet interacts with lower, lower layers. Uh, and so we give examples of DLIP and, and BFD. Um, this, this deals also with the Pareo discussion uh, that, uh, you know, she, you've just uh, reopened this morning in this email. Um, so I thought maybe we, we will discuss that. Is Pareo a layer violation? We, my reading, is that PIO is controlled in the DeathNet layers, but sometimes operated in the lower layers. Like if you want to trigger, uh, if you want to tell layer two that it has a bounded time to do its retries, or it can do only a bounded number of retries, or it need to do the retries over a, uh, a series of links, as opposed to doing all the retries on the same link. All those controls, uh, can only be requests from the from our layers, but they are instantiated, they are operated at the lower layers. Now, it's not the only thing which which is like that. I mean, if you look at shapers, for instance, now we're importing some shapers uh, at layer three in that net, but doesn't mean that there are no shapers in layer two, and there can be TSN below. And I guess there will be some interactions, some APIs, some whatever for uh, layer three to say, hey, I'm doing my shapers, or you have to do it to do the shaping for me. Because you, I expect you won't try to have shapers at both layers on the same box. It may interact in a very bizarre fashion. So same thing here. I mean, that, that we are layer three, we are doing requests to the lower layers, and we expect the lower layers to do something. Otherwise, it won't operate as expected. But I don't see it as a layer violation. Yeah, no, she is still using that term. We are just requesting stuff. So, so the overall operation, yes, is cross layer. The, the overall thing to operate has to have components at different layers, but each layer has its responsibilities. I'm, I'm unclear with you know what you call a layer violation here. Do you want comments now or later? I mean, since it's the discussion, right? I mean, yes, please. Yeah, we do have some time. Uh, so I think that if you yes, Please, Lou, uh, close, very, please talk very close to the mic. For some reason, it's very hard to hear you. I had to push all the volumes to the maximum just to hear you during your initial speech. OK, hopefully you can hear me now. Oh, very well. Um, I think if you adopt the changes that Janos talked about, we're moving some of those functions down to the forwarding layer. You remove the layer violation. At least that's my read as a, as a contributor. I don't know if Janos agrees because we haven't discussed that part. But I think that could, would help with the layer violation. They are already discussed as being lower layer. I mean, we have to, to see which function exactly. But yes, that's already done that way. Uh, the picture was the, the, that Janos provided makes things very clear, and I really love that picture, and I agree with it. Uh, but I don't see that the current text still has this layer violation that was there a year ago or something. I mean, things have changed. And so if there is still something left, that's what I'm after. 
So I'm not sure if I have managed to be clear, but what I wanted to point out that there are good intention in the document, good text, and we discussed it uh, uh, a lot. And uh, uh, we agree on many points like, like requests and the indications going through an API, that's proper layering. That's not a layer violation, but Pareo as such, the combination of ARC and, and uh, PREOF is a layer violation. That's not, not the putting the two together. They are residing, they reside in a completely different layers. That's the point I did try to make. So proper oh. requests and the indications and so on going to an API, that's abs absolutely appropriate. And moving the PLR to the forwarding layer makes it like easier or so that was my okay. Point. So I think I see what you're saying. It's because I believe that in the document we call Pareo a certain achieving a certain set of functions. And to achieve those functions, we need cooperation between layers. And that's that's the big picture we call Pareo. So yes, if you have your layers, you could draw a square that goes vertical across the layers and that achieves Pareo. But it needs that combination of effort, a different layer using requests to, to get the Pareo uh, actuated. But if you think about it, sending a packet out also is also a, a vertical square across the layers, where you see the, the packet being encapsulated and going down the layers. And that's packet forwarding. So Pareo is like packet forwarding. It's something that goes across the layers to achieve something global. It's, it's Pareo itself is not is not a function in one layer. It is something which is being achieved by the cooperation of multiple layers. Then some part of the text maybe needs refinement because the definition, yeah. the text, I don't remember the section number by heart, of Pareo says it's the superset of Hark and Priof. And creating such a superset itself in my view, is a layer violation. Having, a, I could not come up with a good name yet, but uh, the overall operation, like as I said, the requests and so on, the indications going up and down to an API, that's proper. We have to, we may define a good yeah. a, a standalone name for Let's work together offline then let's, on, let's on take cleaning this up the text. For the writing. Yeah. Because it's like packet forwarding, it's not intended to be one layer thing. Okay. Um, next slide, I guess. I don't have many uh, slides, Lou. How much time do I have left? Uh, you have uh, six minutes, six and a half minutes. I see Kiran in the queue, but I don't see you on the tool. Maybe it's missing. Okay, so it's not on my tool. Uh, fine. Um, okay. I, Pascal, I have a clarification question on your previous slide on terminology. So you replace the name from .NET controller plane to operational plane. Um, I haven't followed raw architecture, so I don't know why would you do that. And m more important question is, since now we have a common charter for both, does it impact the terminology for the .NET documents also, or should we leave them as is? Yeah, I, th th I don't think the term operational plane was expressed like that in the .NET architecture. I think it comes from the OAM world. So it's, but, but the controller plane kind of includes operation and management. That's, that's pretty much, in my view, what you find in controller plane. So it's, it's when you refine the controller plane and you look at what's management and what's operation that you find that what we do in row lives in the operational subset of the controller plane. So it's not like we're removing controller plane. The .NET controller plane is defined in the .NET architecture. It's there to stay. It's just that if you look at it with a magnifying glass, you will see inside management and operation. And as you and and if we wanted our architecture on that, guess, I guess that's what Greg wanted here, um, to be more crisp. Yes, we are in the controller plane. I mean, that's still true. But more specifically, we are in the operational piece of the controller plane. 
Do I make sense? Okay, we'll discuss it on the mailing list. I'm, I'm still not clear about a few things. Okay, and, and then again, it's very new. As, as you point out, it's not cast in stone, right? It's just, I, I, I agreed with Greg that it was clear this way. Now, if for some reason we find that it's not a good idea, I'll just roll back. Okay. You have four so, minutes, to get through. Yeah, yeah on two slides, Luke. So um, I, I feel good about it. Um, so, so we try to, to give this, this picture about what is in, um, oh, and it says management sub-layer, which really should say now uh, operational sub-layer, by the way. So there's still a bug on that picture. Uh, but we, we have a piece which comes from row, which is the, uh, the upper tier of this picture. Then we've got the, the dead net service sub-layer, which was there before row, which we enhance by some actuating function that serve Pareo. And, and then at the lower layer, we, we uh, use things which uh, DeathNet defines fully like, like how, how DeathNet uses OAM. So that's, that's what we wanted to position. We really wanted to position that we have this upper tier that was not really uh, observed or discussed before row. Uh, but now belongs to that net and extends that net. And then they have to, f to fix that typo. It's not management, it's operation. Um, and then two more sentences, which I thought were, were worth discussing with the group. Um, so this concept of recovery graph, which again, is not necessarily a path, but more a set of vertices, a big bag of vertices. Uh, which could be structured as, as a set of uh, recovery path or could be structured just as a big graph. Um, and it's a layer three graph, so it's completely agnostic to, to wire or wireless. So very clearly we apply to wire. Some of those hops in the graph could be wired as well. Um, and the second thing, which is where we, we throw, we, we kind of went beyond that net somehow, or beyond is a big word, it's not, probably not what I mean, but in that net, you expect every hop to be that net compliant, otherwise you cannot provide that net guarantees. Um, here in row, at some points, because of the fact that the wireless hops could be a lot more lossy, for instance, the first hop, the access, link being wireless could be a lot more lossy than the rest of the way. We can also ignore kind of the, the, the losses or, or the latency, which is due to the rest of the path and, and compute as if all the losses and all the latency variation that we see were coming from the access link. In which case, and I'm thinking about Wi-Fi MLO, for instance, as a, an instance of, of what I mean here. If you have Wi-Fi MLO, you have um, all the Wi-Fi primes that you're looking at, and the rest of the way is a few wired links, which might be very, very uh, reliable versus those wireless links. And so we, we would possibly control and measure only the wireless hubs in the whole network and kind of ignore uh, the rest which is not what, what that net does basically. So that, that's what we have, uh, we mean by this loose recovery graph. It might be that between two hops in the recovery graph, you have a full network that we cannot observe. We can only measure at layer three from ingress to egress and send probes and see you know, from, from a distance what, what happens in, the, in that loose hop. But but really, we cannot go to the lower layer and, and ask questions or, or force anything. It's just like a, a, a cloud. So, so this, this piece is important for row and it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't show in that net, basically. So, so this concept of a black network, an opaque network, where that you can just measure from the outside and expects some degree of reliability and then include that in your uh, PLR computation. As if it was one wireless hub, for instance. Okay, so I wanted to insist on that. 
And with this, pretty much done with this presentation. Uh, uh, as, as you said, Ro, uh, 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 as you said at the very uh, beginning of, of the meeting, Lou, um, yes, I have some words on the framework. Um, the framework has been stalled for a while because the framework for Ro was intended to cover the realization of the architecture. So sometimes people call things architecture, call things framework. We made this agreement at Rowe that the architecture is kind of before the fact. Here is the structure of what we want to build on paper before the fact. That is the intention. And the framework would be more like at the end of the path. Here is what we did and how we did it. So how we kind of implement the architecture, if you like. So, so the architecture cannot point at, at existing RFCs because they don't necessarily already exist. They, are, they will be done as, as the work at DeathNet for this architecture. But then the framework in the end can, can take everything together and say, here is how the story works for all. So the framework is, is already there, but it's, it's just at its beginning and the intention is to keep updating it till we're happy that we've done the job. So for me now we are, since the architecture is more like the declaration of intention, and after I, I cover uh, the, the changes that Yanosh has proposed, and I already reviewed some of them and I'm very happy with, with what Yanosh has proposed, so, so it should not be too difficult. Um, then, yes, I would ask the chair to go for uh, work group uh, uh, last call, and, and, and from there we start working on the, on the framework instead. Pascal, thank you for the changes. They've been quite substantive since the last meeting, and uh, I think it's really moved the document forward. Really appreciate that. I want to recognize that. Um, that said, I think there's a little more work to do. We'd like to try to um, close out the topics on uh, the, the list in the next like month or so. If we are successful, that's great. If we're not, we probably will want to schedule an interim and not wait for the next meeting because we'd like to wrap this document up. Really appreciate the, the great work and um, look forward to working with you. Uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, please do send them to the list. If something is confusing, Help us out by uh, getting it now rather than when we go to last call. Uh, with that, we're going to move to uh, Carlos. Car Carlos has three non-working group drafts. We're going to, uh, the, um, Pascal went over a little bit, so we're going to steal some time from you. Uh, but you have three documents to make it up for. Yep. And we're also going to run the experiment of cutting a little short on your time so that you have time for discussion from, and questions. Sure, thanks. Uh, actually, I, I, I think I will need even less time, so it should be fine. So thanks, uh, Lou, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Carlos Bernardo from USDM, and I'm going to present three drafts on three different kind of uh, topics that were discussed to some extent already in, in the role working group. but. As I will try to summarize, always like uh, trying to introduce topics, but not uh, really getting into adoption or things like that, because it was not at the time at, at that time. Probably it's not even the time now, but I want to bring now the topics now that uh, Roy is in, in DeadNet. Next slide, please. So the first one is about multi-domain. So the motivation for this was that in, in Raw, and I think to some extent also in DeadNet, the focus so far has been mostly on single domain topics. Uh, although in DeadNet is clear that the multi-domain uh, was in scopes in the, since the very beginning and therefore raw as well because raw depended on, on, on DeadNet. But there were some kind of, all the documents were kind of assuming an architecture uh, with a multi-domain. But there are some uh, scenarios, last use cases that uh, we believe will benefit or will require some kind of multi-domain interactions. For example, when you may have end hosts connected through multiple domains that require to have dead net raw connectivity. And we refer to some potential realistic use cases in the document like uh, large factories, but this is just an example. And the idea was for this draft to explore what are the potential gaps that we had in raw discussion at the time, like in architecture, OIM, uh, etc. 
uh, for multi-domain and start exploring some solutions, okay? This conversation actually already led to some discussion in the DeadNet controller plane framework document where we added some multi-domain things based on this discussion. So there are things already uh, there, but still I think uh, it may be worth, and that's the question at the end to the working group, to look into more, more details. Next slide, please. So this is just an exemplary scenario for the sake of explaining some of the gaps and um, partially the solution, which is just an example of solution. It's not meant to be like the solution by any means. So we have here two domains, each of them with uh, its own PCE. Uh, by the way, apologies because the terminology, as you see, is still the old one, not the one that uh, Pascal just introduced. That's on me that I have to update. I will be doing that. But I guess we all know more or less that we refer to the PC instead of to the PLR and these type of things. So we have these two domains. These domains may be interconnected by single or multiple uh, paths. And if we want to basically support this scenario, we, we may identify multiple gaps. For example, we need to connect the domains between or among them. That may require some work that maybe is not in the scope of, of DeadNet, like how these domains interconnect, discover, and these type of things. But there may be things that are in the scope. And what I believe will be in the scope is one that we have these multiple domains connected. How do we set up the multi-domain paths? And how we set up like OAM mechanisms to work over multiple domains and how we provide some coordination or interoperation between the PSCs, PLRs to, to work. Next slide. So I will not go into the detail. So the, the main goal of the document is to present the, the kind of uh, gaps. And then in the document, there is some solution described, but this an, as an example solution. I basically here, taking the previous example, what we have is that one domain or one node in one domain wants to establish a multi-domain path. Uh, that request gets to one of the, to the ingress PSC, and that talks to the PCE of that domain which is aware of the multi-domain connectivity and that the end, of, the end of, uh, node is in another domain. And based on the knowledge that that PC, PCE has, request some information to the other PCE about the, the path has to be established. The other PCE provides back the information. There is also some computation about how to divide somehow the, the SLA or the requirements on each of the domains and based on that, the, the path can be established and also the OIM monitoring can be established. Again, I will not go into the details, but this is kind of the overall idea. Next slide. So uh, just as a summary, I mentioned this was presented in raw. There was some, I think, good feedback from the chairs in terms of, okay, this is an interesting problem. I was actually ref, uh, deferring discussion about potential next steps until we had advanced more on the raw working group. So it was too early to look into this. Again, it may be early now, but I wanted to bring it up. And what I wanted to ask you guys is feedback now, many days later, about whether you think this may be a potential interesting topic for the working group to look at. If so, how do you think it should be done, whether in this type of document or whether complementing like the DeadNet Control Plane Framework document or others that are there? And just, uh, again, ask for feedback in, on the mailing list. And that will be that for first document. Okay, we have a minute or two <laughs> for questions. I guess I'll be the only one joining. Um, so this goes back to the prior presentation. If you remember when you presented, I can't remember if it was me or Janos, but I think we both agreed on the comment is, how does this tie into uh, DetNet multi-domain? Uh, for example, take your, one of your pictures and instead of having raw talking to raw, have raw talking to uh, a wired domain. Yeah. And it, we, we want to have a, a picture where we have end-to-end -end service where we can go over wireless and wired. I think filling that in would be very helpful. Okay. And it, it, you know, the, the point that we made earlier and you said it just now is that there's some things to be worked out from any .NET multi-domain I think understanding that case will tell us whether or not there's uh, more work to be done here. In prior work that was done with PLRs, point of local repairs, 
uh, there was a notion of protection domains, which I think are very much analogous to the protection graphs or recovery graphs, where there was an explicit decision to not do recovery, mix protection domains across administrative domains. That was a decision there that doesn't line up with what you have shown. And I think this working group could reconsider that of whether that's worth, you know, is it worthwhile trying to mix protection domains uh, across administrative boundaries? Um, it's, I, yeah. I don't have an answer for you. I think it's for the working group. But if we start sorting through the discussion of what does a interdomain debt net look like, we can, we can get to that question. Okay, uh, thanks for the feedback, uh, very useful. And just a single comment on that. Um, we are, I, I'm personally involved in a European funded project that is dealing among other things to end-to-end -to -end kind of dead net path across different technological domains like wire, wireless, 3GPP, TSN, uh, Wi-Fi. So I think your point is very relevant to what we are doing or the other way around. And I guess we can uh, fit some of the work that we are doing there into the working group because I think it relates very much to that. So I think this is a line and uh, of course I will be very excited to get more feedback from you guys but I will try to come up with the next iteration based on your feedback. Uh, that's great. As chair I can say that is within scope of the working group. As contributor I can say I'm very interested in that work. Okay, thanks a lot. So next one is on uh, mobility. Mo mobile pv 6 or mobility because the idea here is to Again, we identify some use cases, but you can go to next, yes, thanks. Where we may have the needs for reliability, availability, deterministic networking, while some of the network nodes move. In this particular scenario, I'm, I'm focusing on the end devices moving, but I think it could be even extended to nodes of the network moving. And, and I think that that may require additional considerations. So the idea of the, of the draft was, again, discuss potential gaps and try to identify control plane extensions or solutions that will be required to go with mobility. The way we do that in the draft, where, again, we have some potential toy, discuss, toy solution or solution to, to discuss is by identifying some uh, control plane mechanisms where the device or the network proactively may prepare for a movement. By movement, I mean change of point of attachment uh, in the network. And to support that, we basically try to uh, implement or see how that could be implemented with existing control plane solutions in the ITF, basically mobile IPv6 extensions. Next slide. This is uh, the table of content. We have like problem statement and then control play solutions. And there we differentiate between uh, UE, basically mobile node control mobility and network control mobility. And then we define uh, specific extensions to proxy mobile IPv6 as an example of potential solution. Next slide. This is a example, a scenario very simple. So we have a raw domain. We limit in that version of the document to single domain, although in the document, there are even extensions to consider multi-domain in the potential in the potential future. So we have a mobile node that is attached to one uh, node in the network that is a row node, point of attachment, and then moves is moving and potentially has to change its point of attachment to a different node and is connecting or is it has a, com a communication with an external node that, for the sake of the example, is an XR, um, extended reality server, but could be whatever that requires dead net type of traffic. Next slide, please. So again, don't panic. I will not go into the details <laughs> of this, but uh, this is just one example, the mobile node control. There is also the network control part in which what I want to highlight here is that uh, there may be a, first, there may be some extensions required for the node to node to know that it has to move or it can move to another point of attachment that is row enabled. Okay, that's the difference between traditional mobile IP or mobility scenarios where this is already something that has been looked at in the past. Some point in time that the mobile node will decide to move and before it actually moves, it can signal to the current point of attachment, again, using mechanisms that are based on existing fast mobility protocols that were done in the ATF about this mobility and about the requirements from the net perspective on the net specifics to the network. So the current point of attachment, which is a raw PC, PSC, PLR, can get in touch with the 
new potential point of attachment and prepare the network and all the, the computation of the paths before the node moves. That may even include by casting, which is also something that has been done in mobility in the past for enhanced reliability while the node is moving because at the end of the day, there will be a layer two attachment, layer two, uh, sorry, Hanover, that we may, may imply, depending, imply depending on the layer two technology about some packet loss and things like that. So again, just to try to mitigate the impact of the layer two Hanover. And then once everything is prepared, then the trigger or the confirmation can go back to the mobile node and the mobile node can move and eventually uh, minimize the impact of that mobility on the end-to-end -end communication. Next slide, please. This is just the signaling for the network control solution. It's very similar, but in this case, is the network deciding to move the, the mobile node and communicating the mobile node that has to move. So the preparation is done before by the network and then the trigger is sent to the, to the mobile node. Next slide. And here, I will not go into the details, but in the drafts, you, will, you, you have like mobile IPv6 based extensions on existing protocol uh, work for the new messages or options that we identify as potentially required, okay, with raw specifics. Uh, I will not go into the, all the details. You can go to next. Just new mobility options, new mobility messages, and next slide. So just to go into the summary, again, this was presented also to in the raw working group with some uh, good feedback. As before, it was too early to go into more details. And again, my humble request for you guys is feedback. Do you consider this is potentially relevant? Uh, if so, do you think that should be done here, should be done in DMN, should be done in cooperation? This was presented also on some ITF in the past into the DMN working group, which is the host of the maintenance of the mobile IPv6 protocol. Any feedback that you may have, please send it to the mailing list or to me. That would be very much appreciated. The Wi-Fi sucks here, so I couldn't even get official stuff. To all the sacred. Um, so I think uh, if the whole IPv6 mobility is kind of working perfectly fine without you know, dead net reliability, throughput latency, and so re requirements, uh, and, and we're only talking about the additional ones, then it's fine to do it in, in dead net slash raw. But I'm not quite sure if what I've seen of, of the existing assumed raw uh, networks that that is the case, right? So if it's about, you know, basic mobility in the way that you're saying with the with, uh, uh, mobile IPv6, if that would be something new for these uh, raw networks in the first place, then I would be worried whether we have all the expertise to do that. Okay, that's a fair point. Thanks. I, I, I mean, I've been involved in mobility and in, involved in, in dead net, so that's why I, I mean, I think I have a good overview of both sides of the <laughs> picture, but I, I understand that uh, probably, yes, we will be missing some knowledge on the mobility part, and on the other hand, on the DMN, they would probably not have the knowledge about the dead net. So yeah, in case we want to go there to, to work on this, that would be a question to, to have, yes. Okay, I joined the queue. Um, is this, uh, and I'm not joking, is this single domain or multi-domain? This is, the, the solutions is single domain, but the, the options, one of them is specifically there to support potential in multi-domain in the future. So the draft is saying, for the time being, is multi-domain could be a single domain could be multi-domain in the future. Because I think the solution approach might differ. In a single domain, using a PLR-based approach uh, is viable. Uh, multi-domain, it may not be. So you might go more agree. to the DMM solution. So you know there might be something you can do special for raw uh, in single domain. Okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And then maybe another question if uh, what is wireless specific or I mean, I mean, when it comes to mobility or. Well, I mean, what is wireless or, specific? Or, or like, would it be like same for wireline or more changing between wireless and wireline? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can move to between wireless and, and wire domain. Yes, that will be that will be something else to look at. I was, I mean, considering mobility as like wireless specific for the time being, from the point of view that at least you have to move from wireless or to wireless because I mean, moving in the wire, that would not be <laughs> that, 
Uh, but I think there are things specific to the wireless in terms of the requirements and in terms of uh, how to ensure and compute and all these type of things are specific for the wireless domain as compared, I mean, for the wireless dead net domain as compared of mobility work that has been done in, in, in mobile IPv6. And I guess in dead net will only apply if we have wireless to fix or fix to wireless. Which, yeah, is in the scope. Definitely good use cases. Yeah. Okay. So last one. I promise, <laughs> is uh, this a bit more like informational kind of thing, uh, although at the end we mentioned that it's about, uh, or it may require a new protocol work. I guess this is more like an example of use of raw technology uh, in integrating also edge kind of work. So the idea here is to explore how raw could integrate with edge computing, in particular, taking as an example the Etsy mobile uh, multiple access edge computing, the MEC architecture. And there were two documents. One that is the one I'm presenting that is how to extend uh, or how to integrate raw in, uh, in MEC deployments. But there is also another document that is how to benefit from the information about the availability of the raw network, uh, a raw network and the capabilities of that raw network for a device to select where to connect, considering both the raw and the edge uh, availability. So that will be, to that some extent, similar to what CATS is looking at, to some extent, because at the end you have edge uh, locations, you have a network in between, which is a raw network. So how to take a decision that takes both the network side and the compute edge side into the picture. But that, that's the second document I will focus on the first. Next slide. So this is the, the scenario. So we have a raw network, single domain, uh, where we may have multiple edge platforms or hosts or locations where you can instantiate edge applications, make hosts using the terminology of, of Etsy. That may be relevant for some industry for those zero scenarios. And you want to ensure low latency and some availability between the terminal attached to the network and the MEC platform where the application is instantiated. So I think in that case, it, make, it makes sense to have this network connecting the platform and the terminal row enable or dead end enable. Um, and the idea here will be how to simplify how the traffic, the, the kind of the procedures will look like to enable this type of scenario. Next slide. This is uh, basically from an architecture logical point of view how it may look like. So you have the MEC platform on the left hand side, the raw network on the right hand side. And we describe that we will need to have some kind of agent or logical controlling or requesting entity on the MEC platform, this raw controller, that basically knowing the requirements of the MEC application service, you will have to request to the raw network the uh, configuration of the network to come to basically to to meet those requirements that may require extensions maybe on the etsy side but i, I think here in the raw dead net world is a good example of how kind of a north bone api between the the raw dead net and an external user which is the edge platform how to integrate so next slide please there are different procedures covered as an example of things that may need to be done or how they may be done. One is the pure request from the edge uh, side. Okay, we want to deploy this application. These are the requirements. Please configure the network appropriately to, to meet the requirements. That's one. But then there is also the interaction between the OIM mechanisms on the raw side and on the next side to benefit the other side. So basically, you may have changes on the raw network that may imply a decision to migrate an application to another MEC platform. And the other way around, there may be uh, changes reported on the MEC side that may help Raw to adapt. Uh, next slide. So here we'll just present uh, some very simple uh, diagram for the first case. So you have the MEC application request for Raw. So basically you have in the, in the, in the MEC side, the request to instantiate up an application that will have to interact to interact with the raw PSC, the raw controller plane kind of, to then request that instantiation, that's computation on the raw network. And once this is done, the MEC traffic application can be, can be instantiated. And then later, we can also do the interactions or integrations from uh, OIM to 
benefit neck in knowing the status of the row and maybe potentially requiring to migrate the application and the other way around, as I mentioned before. Next slide. Or would you have comments? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I thought this slide might be a good place to ask the question. Yes. Um, what is specific between the, the application and the, the controller that is specific to raw? Why isn't this just that then? Yeah, that could be then, yes, yes. Okay. I 100% agree, that would be then, yes. Um, this is another thing. I will not go into the details. I don't. I, mean, I don't think we have time. And again, uh, same questions. Uh, do you think this is worth documenting or discussing? Maybe not documenting. We don't need to actually document this anywhere, but discuss uh, as a as a working group document. I mean, it could be an individual document for some time. Uh, this type of use cases and this type of flows where we can see integration of raw with other technologies and try to understand what may be the gaps from the control plane, from the application plane, these type of things. And uh, if so, uh, please, again, let me know and, and I will be happy to discuss and, and do work with other people on these type of topics. And that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Questions? Okay. So, uh, Right now, the only sort of application-facing API we have is a Yang model. Uh, and I think you were saying that this, you could use the Yang model from the application-facing yes, yes. side. So if you had, um, if you wanted to explore this use case and look at other alternative ways for an application to talk to a DetNet, which could include a raw network, yeah. Uh, I think that would be something we'd like to hear about. We had a controller plane framework that seems to have stalled. So if you have, and you know, we're cont contribution driven. So if you have a contribution in this area, we, it's probably worth hearing about. Okay. Uh, I, the, my only comment is, you know, say uh, a DetNet, e.g. Raw, a raw network, as yeah. opposed to it yeah, has yeah. to be a raw network. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. This is a bit, I'm a bit it's still kind of, uh, I don't know how to say, but. No, oh, I, I know oh. you, you, came, you came from a, a different yeah. perspective, and that's, but, that's all good. But I fully agree and echo that uh, has to be that net. Yeah. yeah, appreciate that. I also appreciate that you said you recognize that you need a terminology update. So thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, 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 that for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, and thank you for putting us back on schedule. <laughs> so, uh, Kieran, you're going to be up next. And we're going to try the same thing of giving you eight minutes to talk and leaving a few minutes to for questions. And if questions come up in the middle, we'll give you your time back. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, I've been talking about it from last two IETFs, and this is just to give an update on some of the review comments I collected from uh, people. So. Just a quick recap, what we are trying to do is um, implement a use case for remote process automation. And that's why the term operations and control is there. And how do we express those uh, traffic patterns in IPv6 extension header and hand it off to DetNet for, um, as a transport? So our interface is between the application layer where it uses OCN extension header and then uh, between the relay node. Uh, one thing we changed in the format was added a reply bit. So just to explore it a bit, uh, explore it a bit more that one of the traffic pattern was urgent alarm. So we will set a flag urgent in the packet so that DetNet knows how to uh, handle that packet. Then we have latency budget information. And uh, reply bit is something we added later on. So let's say there is a case an error condition and that not, that not cannot provide that service. It can send a reply back to the application. Next slide. So updates, major updates are in section four and section five. Section four is just uh, um, removing some of the stuff that I felt was not necessary, like giving some background on the .NET architecture. We trimmed down that section. And most of the comments were focused on uh, uh, chapter fifth, and 
one thing we wanted to clarify that this is an IP based solution. So there was some confusion about uh, TSN, how, how does interface work with TSN or time sensitive networks. That's not the part of this discussion. We are only focused on the IP based. So that's uh, to keep that in mind, we added a section um, goals and non goals that completely de describes the scope of what we are trying to achieve in this document. For example, one of the thing was uh, a lot of people asked, how will you do the mapping? And since it is an interface from an application to network, uh, mapping can be done in a many different ways. Um, it can be based on IP network. If your DetNet is supported as an IP based network, it could be MPLS based or segment right routing based solution. And um, owner of the debt operator of the DetNet could use uh, proprietary or standard, whatever mechanisms to map the information. Only expectation is that uh, relay node should understand the parameters of extension header. Next slide. Um, so another question was, okay, for DetNet, you need to have reserv a reservation of resources, but you don't talk about that with extension header. And so we clarified now a workflow, how this will happen. Um, an application management entity will uh, at the provisioning phase, we'll talk to DetNet controller plane and allocate the resources in bulk at the start. And then later on applications associated from that site, for example, if I have a virtual PLC, that, can, that will send the packets based on extension header. And if there is any violation, that will trigger an error and that's where our reply bit will send, an, send a response back to application saying, hey, you're, you're, it, it's an exception. You're asking for something you were not provisioned for. So next slide. Another thing, um, one of the question was, how will you support periodic traffic? So we did not, and periodic traffic here means something like on time uh, latency, if you have to follow the strict schedules. So initially when I was writing this document, I thought for that we need a, a time synchronous domains. So maybe extension header is not a good solution for that, especially for an TSN type of approaches might be much better. But since now we are coming up with uh, large scale network support and how these uh, scheduling algorithms will evolve, we may have an opportunity to support uh, periodic traffic and uh, we can look at that later on. And a related question was extreme latency uh, flows. And uh, this is something, uh, my answer is pretty much the same that I did not explore it. I would expect that uh, if the latencies are much lower than say 10 milliseconds and all, it depends on how you have deployed the network. We don't make any judgment about what parameters are sent in the network. If .NET can support it, it will process it. Otherwise there will be an error. And um, one of the important question asked was, will you have any impact on the field devices? For example, your actuators and sensors that are actually, um, that are installed in the factory floor. So uh, for that, what we have done is the gateway, translation gateway that is associated with those field devices will terminate the extension header. If extension header is coming to that level or it will do any protocol translation the way it would have done with .NET. So that, that thing is also taken care of. Next slide. What else? Um, some traffic spill. Yeah, I already talked about uh, a lot of these things and uh, a third bullet is more important to discuss here that uh, there was a question that how do you handle extension header? Is it something that you will strip at the relay node and let the rest of the packet pass through DetNet all the way to the DetNet gateway, which is uh, connected to the field devices? And there are two approaches. Best approach would be that if every DetNet node in the network is capable of processing extension header and give it the right treatment, that's the way to go about it. But for the scope of this document, what we are saying is extension header is only understood by the relay node. And then you translate it into a DetNet flow and uh, carry forward the packet or transport it using uh, DetNet properties. 
that's about it. We have collected a lot of feedback and um, the feelings are mixed in the sense that uh, people think that it is a valid um, problem to work on, but uh, should we use, and they don't have any clear opinion whether we should use EH uh, extension header option or for this or not. Um, I'm still talking to more people and get them on board for this work. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll continue to get more review comments. And just to show how this works, this is a note to myself that we'll try to talk about demo in next ITF. So at the last meeting, we asked for interest in the document, and we didn't get a lot of people mm -hmm. who had read it. Um, and while it's not fair to the people outside the room, I just want to do a quick poll inside the room, just out of curiosity, to see how many have uh, read it and see if it's uh, more than the last time. So last time we did the poll with the, the uh, outside, and it was about a third of the logical room or virtual room. Just out of curiosity, can you raise your hand if you've read this graph? So we have two people out of... Uh, says uh, 91 people, but there's a good number of people in the room, uh, and it's a really small number. Uh, I think it, it's interesting work, um, and but you're also pushing bounds quite a bit on different areas. You have a, uh, in addition to app flow and debt net flow, you now have, there's a new flow term in the document. Uh, I forget what it's called. Yeah, flowlet. Yeah, flow, -let. Is, uh, yeah, uh, flow -let. and you know, if you want to go that way, you're going to have to spend a, a good amount of time understanding mm -hmm. how the relationship there before just jumping into defining new formats. Also, you're uh, showing, you're uh, saying you're informational, but you're defining packet formats. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's something interesting here, but you haven't captured the interest of the group yet. So if you can uh, talk more on the list, uh, see me if we can generate some interest. Sure. It's unfortunate people who have read the document are not in the room. <laughs> Uh, feel free to put into chat that you have read it, so everyone can participate. Uh, yeah, so agreed, and maybe one of the interesting feedbacks would be if there are any particular subsets of what's being presented that, that, that people are interested in, right? So for me, particularly, I'm worried about that overall in DeadNet, we don't have any, you know, application-facing APIs, right? We've got a controller plane, and most of the legacy deployments will expect that everything is done on behalf of application devices through controller because that's classical on how it was done in TSN. But I'm, I'm very worried that in the, um, you know, uh, dead net environments, we would rather have to have typical APIs going into applications. So that's the subset I, I was particularly interested in this work. Well, well that's actually great because the uh, prior presentation, we came mm -hmm. to the same conclusion that there might mm -hmm. be something there on the API side. Right. Uh, so maybe you want to get together with Carlos and sure. see if there's something, just pick that one piece and start and start there. Sure. Uh, and maybe collaborate on a document, a contribution there, and that'll generate more interest. Yeah, yeah. let's try that. So little steps instead of one massive Thanks. one. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, David, you are next, and I give you the control over the slides. And you have uh, 17 and a half minutes. Yeah, you probably ought to set the timer for something considerably shorter because uh, goal of this is, is goal of the slide deck is not to consume all the remaining time, but to consume maybe the first five minutes, maybe, and allow plenty of time for discussion. So thank, 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 thank you, Karen, for leaving some extra time. This is a uh, <clears throat> this this is a report on uh, what we've been doing in enhanced uh, data, data plane <clears throat> open working meetings. Um, we've held four meetings since the last IETF. Uh, been a two part agenda. Uh, each of them, one is in process oriented topics, requirements, draft contents, uh, etc. And two has been initial evaluations of new proposed scheduling queuing mechanisms. I want to emphasize that this has been initial evaluations by the proposers. These are not, these, these are not sort of representative of, of anything broader yet. We've had a couple of good process-oriented outcomes, another round of revisions to the scaling requirements draft, and in particular, some clarity on how latency and jitter scaling differ. 
and we have roughly common initial valuation templates, which is not a bad place to be. Um, there are initial valuations of new proposed mechanisms against requirements. Uh, this is, as I said, led, led to more vision skill requirements draft. All those slides are in this deck, but they're for reference. I don't propose uh, to present them here. There are, there are more, more productive uh, uses of time. Okay, so that's what we've done. So now what? Well, the meetings have been productive. Each evaluation, evaluation has, have been produced. And we can certainly hold more meetings. I mean, I mean, we we we've got the mechanics of of holding meetings uh, um, down, and we we can do this. But the question is, why should we hold meetings? Uh, the next goal um, in sight is working group selection of mechanisms to standardize, and that's by rough consensus of a whole working group. And if that's the goal, the question then becomes twofold: How do we get there? And how would or should open meetings help us get there? Because if you think back to the timeline slides that Lou put up at the start of this meeting, um, they anticipate uh, adoption of the draft of, of some initial uh, drafts for these mechanisms by the next IETF meeting. And with that um, open discussion, one of the possibilities that has been sort of briefly discussed in the mailing list is to use some kind of taxonomy to classify the proposed mechanisms into categories and that might help us uh make some per category decisions as opposed to trying to make some make some uh some global decisions and with that i will quickly run through the slides uh that have been produced for initial evaluations and then i think it's open discussion so we have the slides your c score deadline deadline revised uh tcqf and csqf on one slide glbf tqf revised evolved tqf um this is q resizing which was added uh, a bit later in the working meetings and then this is the final summary slide that sort of show shows where we are the, the, the takeaway to take from here is that uh, there are a good number of yeses in all the categories, and in particular in the two categories that, that have been problematic, uh, three, four, one, and three, seven, both of which are, sca are scalability. All right, let me see if I can get back to the correct slide, that one. Um, so I can't see the queue from here. Somebody will have to have to have to run have to run the queue in the room. Uh, there, there is Torlos in the queue, but why don't you finish this slide? Because I think this is actually the last uh, non-discussion slide, right? Yeah, I think I'm basically done with this slide. It's a, the, 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 the overall question is sort of that second big bullet. Now, what do we do um, in order to get towards selection mechanisms to standardize? And as I mentioned mentioned sort of uh, a minute or two ago, there's been some discussion on the list and in the most recent open meeting, but perhaps we'll take a, ta take a taxonomy, characterize the new proposals by sort of how they work, including which TSN mechanism they are similar to, and use that to sort of structure uh, selection by category as opposed to uh, uh, a, a global selection problem. So if I can paraphrase or make sure I understand, um, you're suggesting that there might be multiple uh, types of queuing algorithms so that the work, it might be reasonable for the working group to consider uh, pursuing multiple solutions, but that are uh, aimed at different classes of either requirements or problems. Is that a correct interpretation of what you just said? Yes. So anything that, any of the discussion that uh, you can have, that folks in the room can have who are uh, contributors to the different solutions, if you can help us understand the different types of problems you're solving, the different set of requirements you're addressing, so that we can understand if we're talking apples and oranges as we're going between the, uh, the different queuing solutions or if we're talking uh, competing solutions. That would be very helpful uh, to the group. Thank you. Tell the secret again. Yeah, so in, in counter, so the, um, I hope it's fair to say that uh, the, 
this meeting had primarily people on it that were involved in uh, authoring either the requirements document or uh, and or some of the uh, proposals, but we didn't have the whole working group. And um, one 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 of the things I was kind of in through through this this group uh, interested to hear a little bit more technical discussion about is how we feel we can inherit. Um, existing TSN queuing mechanisms um, as much as possible unchanged. I think a little bit of uh, the things that the, the people who are working in TSN, like you know, one of the co-chairs, um, and 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 who else is there? I don't think we had had you very much on on this discussion in the side meetings. And while I don't think that the TSN solutions support the large scale from which we started this whole effort, I think that there is certainly very worthwhile to consider that there is easily applicable to that net um, for, for other scale networks. And I'm a little bit worried that we can simply assume that something like TSN ATS can simply be deployed as a dead net solution um, without introducing the additional complexity that you always have to have the dead net layer and then a layer two kind of a, a TSN layer in it, as opposed to just, you know, a, a TSN ATS queuing layer that directly works on um, uh, the TSN, uh, sorry, on the dead net uh, five or six tuple flows as opposed to the, the flow classifiers that we have in TSN, which are all Ethernet flow classifiers, right? So I, I, exactly. So if you're uh, winking your head, I may be wrong, but I don't think that that, that, is, that is actually very, very clear from our current work. It, it sounds to me that you've just volunteered to write a new draft, which is an informational document saying how DetNet can make use of existing TSN queuing mechanisms without running all of TSN. And I think that people who know TSN better than me would have a much easier chance to do that, or at least in collaboration of, of doing something like that, right? So kind of getting rid of that duplicate layer of complexity, inheriting the subset of TSN that's applicable, which is the, let's say, ATS queuing, but with dead net classification, hop by hop on every dead net hop, right? So that, and if you're saying we don't need a draft or in, in any case, right? We're oh, maybe for, running for out of time of here, but it would be great to have some technical discussion about that part. Okay, for those of us who've been I working was... this for a long time, I think there's general agreement that what you said is completely valid, that there is nothing that precludes using an existing queuing mechanism, whatever, wherever you get it with DebtNet. We don't have applicability documents or documents that even informational documents that say, here's how you do it, or if someone thinks it's a BCP, I'm not sure it's a protocol spec, but maybe it's, it's a BCP or an informational document. We don't have those, mm -hmm. but I personally agree. I think that would be informative to those who, are, who haven't been working this for years, like a few of us or some of us. Uh, so I think that, that would be a great document. It's just that, you know, I, I know what the DeadNet site wants, but I mean, these TSN documents are humongous, right? And they have a lot of details where it's unclear what can we say they're out of scope, like, you know, it's easy for the uh, breaking packets apart, which which we don't have, right? So that that's why it would be great if people who are actually been working on TSN would also to volunteer on on helping with that work, right? But I think that one of the things that came up, which I haven't found in the slides, and otherwise, yeah, so for the main question that uh, uh, David Black is raising, how do we get to further agreement? I think maybe for all the people involved in the effort who are here, maybe we should also find more certain time to try to brainstorm that answer when we're running out of time here. And I think Wednesday's meeting is also full of presentations. Yeah, uh, My experience has been that the system, the people that are building systems uh, understand that and they uh, they solve it for their system and they have no interest in publishing information that helps their competitor build a competing product. And so I think we're running into that a little bit because it doesn't take a new standard to do this. It just takes some information on, on how to combine the parts. And it might actually on the standard side be as little as actually exposing all the necessary configuration elements for the controller plane, right? So having that as a Yang model, which again is a big pain point for somebody who hasn't been bred to write Yang models. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have to work through that, right? But the whole point is, I think we do want to get uh, DeadNet deployable in a way that um, at least the controller can, um, you know, uh, provision a DeadNet solution across more than one vendor. Yes. So, so Turles, uh, Janos is busy, busy typing into chat that uh, IETF yeah. is, tr sorry, IEEE is trying to help out with 802.1DC. So what I might suggest, and I apologize, I'm stealing uh, Janos's thunder, is write 
a, a sort of an outline of draft that indicates what you think needs to be specified. See if you can take a look at, at 802.1 DC and figure out um, how much of, of, of what you think the problem is uh, IEEE is in the process of solving. Yeah, I wanted to just mention that from the TSN side, such a document is happening. It's really ma mature. It's actually an ITPLA essay ballot, includes Yang. ITPLA essay ballot means open to review by the entire world, literally. Mm -hmm. If you would like to take a look, comment, you are welcome, contact me and let's... Yeah. I think the, the primary thing coming to mind off the top of my head mm -hmm. is obviously the five, six tuple classification yeah. of IP packets as opposed to, you know, VLAN that, and text and all the layer two stuff. That is there in 802.1cb uh, as a the uh, stream identification, including IP header fields. And uh, actually I, I have asked a couple of people following your request to provide more information to the that networking group. And I'm, I'm not again, I mean, I, I also see a value in, in a corresponding DATNET draft that may be easier to find uh, overall in the internet and uh, give pointers and so on. So let's sort if, no, if it's all about, you know, a big list of things we can leave out and nothing new that we need to add, that would be ideal, right? Because that shows that that net is simpler than TSN. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, people from the TSN side like you would, would have more information on that. So thank you very much. Uh, keeping in mind the IETF model for service delivery, we've separated out classification from traffic treatment. So if they're providing the queuing, they don't need to know about how we're doing the classification that becomes a debt net problem. Classification, where we identify based on the five or six tuple and then use one of their queuing mechanisms doesn't require support from them for, the, for classification. Ultimately, I think we need to try to figure out what's the minimum set of documents that an implementer of debt net has to read to get something working, right? And, and if he needs to read all the TSN stuff, especially the stuff he doesn't have to care about, that's, that's not a good solution. So I think it might be interesting to try to do what uh, David was saying and put together a document and see how much is there. And one of the things we can always do is if we think there's enough changes needed in TSN to support DetNet, we can put together a liaison and request those changes. We've had the reverse happen where other groups have come to the IETF and said, hey, will you help us out? We really think we need this change in your technology. We, we can absolutely do that. We can't change their technology, but we can ask for problems that we have to be addressed. Yeah. No, um, if, if they s will have classification based on IP addresses or on, on the five tuples that we, that we want, right? They may already have everything, just a lot more than we, than we need for pure layer three equipment, right? We don't need all the VLAN thingy, for example, all the other classification, right? So it's a subset of that and maybe the queuing can be taken over. But yeah, if, if we want to reasonably say you can use TSN mechanism in DeadNet, I think that's the evaluation that needs to happen. So if you're interested in working on such a document, can you either raise your hand or say your name in chat? And then we can get the people who are interested in working the document together so we can get something going. So if you're interested, put your name in chat. Actually, forget about raising your hand. Just put your name in chat. Uh, if for some reason you can't put your name in chat, um, ask your neighbor to do that or I'll do it. So uh, as for like, um, uh, extending TSN queuing mechanisms. There is actually an ongoing project, uh, the QDV, in early stages, like meaning test group balloting and, and it's contribution driven. So even if not official liaison is not necess necessarily individually, one can come and contribute if you see the need. Well, with nobody at the mics and listening to discussion, I have not heard a strong rationale for continuing the open working meetings. Uh, so I guess we, we, we simply uh, continue to think about that. Is there going to be time for more discussion of what to do next uh, in the Wednesday session, or is that one stuffed to the seams? We have no one in queue. We have a pretty full agenda on Wednesday where we're going to talk through the queuing mechanisms. I do think it would be 
helpful to hear from the proponents of each mechanism of who they think they have, uh, they, they are, um, I, I won't say it delicately, who they're competing with and who's just solving a different problem. That would help us in our Wednesday uh, discussion. Uh, and we have a minute for, actually we don't have a minute for other comments. Uh, thank you all for a very good initial session. We look forward to a uh, great discussion on uh, queuing at the next session. There are a few other topics, so do take a look at the agenda and uh, come prepared to, to talk. Uh, thank you all for your contribution. And see you on Wednesday. Thank you, David. <laughs>